Hi guys, it's hello from Bob, and it's a hello from me. Welcome to the Bob and Ramon show. Hiya. Yeah, we're here. We're here in um, in, in London, um, a little bit apart. I'm sort of Greater North London, and uh, Bob is is more towards the centre. And um, we're here to bring you an interesting episode all about Gary Moore. And uh, excuse us for the clickbait title. We certainly don't think he is a fallen hero whatsoever. But uh, we need to draw your interest into our video. And we're going to use any method we can to do that. Isn't that right, Bob? Oh, uh, cheap and cheerful. <laughs> cheap and cheerful. Now, talking of which, before we get going, we need to talk about uh, the Bob and Ron show and the fact that we've been posting the latest videos, many of which I've been checking out under my own steam from here. Uh, we've been posting them on multiple sites, which is not good practice on YouTube, we know that. The reason is, for those of you that have been with us through the guitar show and now the Bob and Ramon show, is basically we're migrating this part of our content towards Bob and Ramon. And what we need to do is we need to carry as much inheritance as we can from the guitar show across to us. At the moment, the guitar show is doing about 31,000 subscribers and the views vary, but they're in the thousands, tens of thousands. Bob and Ramon show, I think it's got about 130 subscribers as we speak, and the views are in the tens or maybe a hundred and so. So quite shamelessly, what we're doing is we're trying to migrate across as much as we can for those of you that like the content on the different channels. We don't expect all of you to come, but we hope many more of you do. So with that in mind, this is almost a sort of notice for the next foreseeable, could be a week, could be a month, we're actually going to be posting on multiple platforms, even though it's not good practice, and even though some people might not like it a great deal. That's the reason why. That's our intention. Hope you'll understand. Hope you'll indulge us, and we can get on with the knitting. That's and, it. Uh, and the link is in the uh, description. So what we need you guys to do is to subscribe, please. Yes, we beg, we beg you. Yes, we beg now, you. now in, in other good news, right? I've had my jab. I had my jab today. And it was bloody fantastic. That it, wow. The NHS is doing an amazing job. At last, it's fantastic. So. Okay, so. Now, on to the business. On to the business. Well done, Bob. It's good to see you're, um, you're, you haven't got the shakes and you're not sweating. You're taking a, <laughs> like a man. Stiff okay. up a lip. I can't, even, I can't even feel the needle. It's amazing. Wow. So um, today, yes, today's subject is Gary Moore. Um, and I know in the title we said, um, you know, legend or fallen hero. Now, why did we say fallen hero? Well, why did we say that? Well, I don't know. I think he's brilliant. <laughs> but but let's be fair. <laughs> he did. He worked really, really hard. And he also did have a slightly slow start. And, and, a, and a big finish, didn't he? He had a big finish, but um, he definitely, there were definitely peaks and troughs in his career. And, yeah. uh, you know, you know, we're going to hopefully go over a bit of his career today. And um, let's take it back, for example, in 1993 or 94. I can tell you the exact date in a minute. Um, 90, May 1994, he released an album called BBM. And it was really interesting to read. I think it was Charles Shah Murray um, that gave them quite a positive review and said they were even better than Cream. That's from memory. That's not from Wikipedia, by the way. Um, okay. And... Uh, you know, so, but other newspapers around the time were saying, you know, it's just like a poor man's cream and, you know, things have got desperate if they're having to rehash cream. But, you know, as I know Bob's a fan of that album and I'm certainly a fan of that album. I love that. I think that's one of the best things that Gary Moore ever did was make that album yeah. with um, Ginger Baker and uh, Jack Bruce called BBM. Some killer songs. I mean, I know that your band, Bob, does... <laughs> That kind of stuff and uh city of know, gold city of gold and Magic. brilliant dr brilliant drums by ginger baker wasn't because when i've heard that i thought oh ginger baker's going to be a bit dodgy but um ginger baker in fact was just solid his groove so, so look there, there's, there's actually there's a history here because you remember both with bbm and also we've still got the blues if you think about the, the album cover still got the blues yeah right 
you've got a young boy sitting on his bed with a, with the Beano album. That's right. On his bed. Yeah, that's right. Right, and then on the back cover, you've got Gary Moore, mm -hmm. grown up with his Les Paul, all the rest of it. So there's a big kind of claps and heroes thing, which is pretty obvious in his play. So when he had the opportunity to get Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker together, as I'm going to use the words advisedly, as his backing band, I mean, wouldn't you? It's like when I was at the Albert Hall and Bonamassa played, and Bonamassa could invite Eric Clapton on stage with him, the Eric Clapton who had played the Goodbye Cream concert at the Albert Hall that influenced Bonamassa beyond anything else he ever plays, wouldn't you? Shit, well, I would. The actual story was, it's quite interesting actually, because Ginger, uh, sorry, Jack Bruce was doing this kind of, um, you know, remember the Hot, Hot Licks VHS videos? Do you remember them? Hot Licks videos? Yeah. Well, he was doing some kind of uh, how to play like Jack Bruce on the bass. And he recruited right. Gary Husband on the drums and get his mate Gary Moore to play guitar. And oh, they, right, okay. they, they did this series of videos at, in, in the studio. Um, and they did a lot of the cream stuff because, you know, Gary, yeah. I'm sorry, Jack Bruce was demonstrating how he played the bass, you know, talking about yeah. the bass playing. And then that's where, you know, um, Jack Bruce and Gary Moore got the idea, hey, let's go in and do this as a proper band. And I think they... And, even... and don't, don't forget, of course, that, that Jack Bruce had form because Jack Bruce had also stepped in with Corky Lane and uh, a rather uh, chubby chap who was fabulous on a Les Paul Jr. called Leslie West to make Bruce West and Lane after Mountain folded. And of course, Jack Bruce already knew the bass player in Mountain, Felix Papillardi, because Felix Papillardi produced Goodbye Cream. So he was, he was Jack Bruce al Atlantic already record. had kind of reheated yeah. superpower trio credentials from the 70s. So, you know, I, 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 th I think it was just a fantastic, auspicious, you know, meet, meeting of minds and coming away. I don't think that anybody was selling out to anybody. And, well, and the result, in the, in the result, in the case of BBM, is absolutely fantastic. And what's so clever is that in many of the songs on BBM, I think Gary, mainly down to Gary Moore, they've actually, for example, the play, song you just played, um, City of Gold, is an obvious crossroads pastiche. And they've got a white room pastiche on the album. And well, so on. You know, it's, it's almost like a cream pastiche, but it's, it's so well done, it's legit. Well, you know, I mean, like I say, if I go back to when they first formed um it was for this hot Licks type video and so the first couple of gigs as i remember i'm not sure if this is true but i think the first gigs were actually with gary husband and they and and then they they actually did a concert i think then after that um bruce um jack bruce did this concert jack bruce and friends and gary moore came and, and then ginger baker yeah. obviously was involved and so that's really how bbm grew it wasn't a conscious decision of oh okay let's reform cream it yeah. actually if you actually look at the history it was kind of one thing led to another. It was almost a kind of destiny. And then, you know, then they the three of them got together and it was like, well, let's, you know, let's do what, you know, what does Gary Moore do best? And that's blues rock, you know? So, but, but having said that, I think, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, normally I, I, you're, you're the cynical one and I'm the more laissez-faire one, but I'm going to be a little bit sharper on this and say the, the, the choice of songs on BBM, mm -hmm. right? That was quite a cynical pastiche in parts. They're, yeah. they're very definitely, those songs are designed to be cream along songs. They're very, very, very good, but they're cream alongs. So in that sense, I think there was a little bit of a, there was a slightly more cynical motive yeah. running in parallel. Yeah. But by the way, talking yeah. of those gigs, um, I think I'm right in saying that when Coliseum reformed to have a fundraiser for Dick Hextel Smith's family after his death, yep. they played that concert was at the Astoria. Yep. And I was there, but I only got there in time for Coliseum and I missed Gary Moore, who was in Coliseum too, and yeah. Jack Bruce before he died. I think that they were the they were the bloody opening act for Christ's sake. Well, another another interesting thing is obviously with Cream, um you know, when they were writing these um albums, um, you know, and, and Jack Bruce was in, was writing some incredible material. Um, you know, with with uh um, with all of this stuff, um, and uh, just to just to put in to perspective that um, with Disraeli Gears, for example, you know, down and on, that's that's the kind of, you know, that is the the pinnacle, wasn't it?
and Jeb Bruce was writing with Pete Brown. You know, I know we're getting off t- um, subject here, but in yeah. BB, the interesting thing, thing is in BBM, um, he didn't actually write. He wrote with. There's no um, Pete Brown, is there? No. Okay. So he he actually wrote with Gary Moore. So Gary Moore's songwriting. Gary Moore was an amazing songwriter. I want to put it out there. Now let's talk a little well, while bit. We're, while we're talking about live, so his first band, yeah, Skid Row. Yeah, let's go. Back, let's go back to the beginning. Let's let's make this. Let's make this. Uh, in order. Let's go right back to the very beginning. So Skid Row coming out, what, Belfast, Northern Ireland? Yep. Uh, early 70s, right? And they were yep. so young. I think he was 15 or something when, when he was in that band. Yep. They were ridiculously young. Um, fronted Three by Phil them. Linnett. F- f- originally fronted by vocalist Phil Linnett. Originally. He was involved in that scene, wasn't yep. he? Then he went off into the Thin Lizzy thing, and there was a yep. bloke called Brendan Shields, the brush, who was the bass player and singer. That's right, Brush Shields. And, uh, and uh, you see, you're doing this from Wikipedia. I'm doing it from yep. memory. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, I know, I know. <laughs> I saw, so I, scored, I saw Skid Row. Right. I saw Skid Row when I, I must have been 15 and a half, 16. Can and you they remember? were much older than me. Can you they remember? were bonkers. Can you remember the guitar that Gary Moore was playing? Uh, I think that he was playing an a SG. Les Paul Special Les Paul or an special. SG. Right, but a slab, slab body. Right. Yeah. It would the one be amazing. Traded, yeah. Right, it would be he traded. Yeah, it'd be the one that he traded for yeah. Peter Green with Peter Green. Peter Green said, "Go and sell your Les Paul, sorry, your SG. Whatever you get for your SG, give it to me, and I'll give you the Peter Green Les Paul." And I'll give you this guitar. Yeah, insane, mental. Yeah, but I mean, in those days, I mean, you listen to the old Skid Row um, albums. Mm. Yeah, and um, uh, I mean, those guys, they put a lot of notes in. You got a lot of notes for your money in those days. Yeah, Quick. it was. I mean, you know, Chick Corea has just died like this week, and and they yeah. were kind of like almost. Okay. I mean, dare I say this? They they were kind of, you know, a young return for forever, a kind of Bel- Belfast version. You know, they were they were. I know that it was progressive, but it was kind of it was verging. It wasn't jazz, but it was you know progressive rock, and it and you could see that Gary Moore was, you know, he wanted to become a jazz rock player. You could you could see him becoming a jazz rock player. But it was. I mean, Skid Row were, you know, partly because of their youth and partly because they're, you know, they, they were they were incredibly talented, but they still had limited abilities because of their yeah. ages. Yeah. And it's yeah. still Skid Row was very blues and blues rock based. Now, yeah, there was the, there, when you, there was no jazz. For when, kind of when you when you talk about prog rock, and again, you know, age before beauty, I was there, mm-hmm. and prog rock yeah. really subsequently is divided into two things. It's one what people were doing with the blues rock format, and maybe throwing in as much jazz as they could. Grok in those days, but not much more. But the other bands, so yep. yes, Genesis bands like that, they're the, and Crimson, the ones mucking around with funny harmonies, funny time signatures, which is really now what you understand as prog. So the other old version of prog, which was really just extended blues rock yep. bands, yeah, has kind of disappeared. Prog yep. now kind of means, you know, orchestral, mathematical. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So, so let's fast forward because I know he had stints with Thin Lizzy, but let's let's go to Back on the Street, which was really um, his sort of you know really landmark album, wasn't it? In in the seventies, he he, he his released first solo album. album, wasn't it? Yeah, he, well, his first proper. I think his first he he actually yeah. released an album called um, Grinding Stone in seventy three. But his first proper album was um, Back on I've the got, Street. I've got a strange strange idea. Yeah, that I, I've certainly got Back on the Streets again, but I've got Grinding Stone in my vinyl collection. Amazing. It wouldn't surprise me, Bob, with your excellent, eclectic taste. Age before beauty again, you see. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, he, he, you know, he he he's obviously wanting to be a, a leader, and you know, and and and, and a singer, and, and you know, his voice was, he always sort of put a bit, you know, I wouldn't say he was gifted with like Frank Sinatra type vocals, you know, it wasn't a voice where he would stop you in in, in the street, but it, but he could sing, and he always put a lot of effort into his singing, and he sang oh, in yeah. tune, he sang in tune. You know, oh, it's yeah. one thing singing, but singing in tune is, is the real trick. And he had a voice with character, distinctive voice. It was a distinctive, and it worked. It worked yeah. for his music. He made it work. And, and yeah. uh, you know, when he was, later when he was singing songs like Separate Ways, it kind of, it was, it was amazing. So, um, you know, it was, he was uh, developing and, and he always had that contact with Phil Linnett. And here's another thing, you know, with, um, with Gary Moore and Phil Linnett, that they were a really close you know, pair of musicians, they always supported each other and they had a lot of respect for each other, you know, Phil Linnett and Gary Moore, you know. Well, they were probably the most successful, you know, um, uh, guys to come out 
of that town on that kind of thing. Well, yeah. before them, obviously, Van Morrison. Right. But they were probably, you know, it's one, two of its most successful uh, alumni. What was um, Van Morrison's band called again? Um, his first them? band? Them. The Them. Them? Yeah, yeah. Them, yeah. They were kind of really cool, weren't they? Kind of a beat band, sort of soul. See, they, when I was growing up, they, Van Morrison was already too grown up for me. They were already doing kind of a mixture of jazz and pop. Right. And they were all a bit too kind of smooth for me. So I had to grow back into Van Morrison. It took me 20 years. Okay, so let's, let's, let's get back on track here with uh, Bob, <laughs> with uh, Gary Moore. So he, he, he's released his solo album, and then, and then he goes to Coliseum 2. To, yeah. uh, you must have a Coliseum 2 in your record collection, Bob. Do you know I don't? You I don't. never really liked it. I've, I've got the original you. Coliseum because right. Jimmy Litherland, who was the original guitarist, is a good friend of mine. Um, right. uh, and uh, that, yeah, again, Coliseum, you listen to the first two Coliseum yeah. albums, they're very bluesy with a lot yeah. of jazz embellishment, right? Yeah. But Coliseum 2 was was very definitely, it was a British fusion band. So what, what I heard, you know, obviously the um, uh, John Heisman's, John Heisman was a yeah. keyboard player, right? Uh, drummer. Was drummer. He, yeah, he was a drummer, sorry. Axel Smith was the... Um, who, who was uh, the... the... Dave Greenslade. John... Dave Greenslade's the keyboard player. Yeah, sorry, of course, he's the drummer. Yeah, sorry, this is my ignorance. Sorry, apologies to everybody I'm here sorry, watching. Viewers, viewers, I'm doing all this from memory. I'm trying to do this from <laughs> the end. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, let's, let's get back to it. Who was the keyboardist in Coliseum 2? Who was... Who Dave Greenslade. Right. So this is a, this is a, an interesting thing. I, I heard this from a friend of mine told me this when I was literally 19. And he said the thing with Gary Moore, yeah, is when he went into that band, he, he was taught the modes. And this is really important. He was taught all the modes all over his neck. So because Gary Moore didn't, you know, obviously didn't, go to college, whatever, and, and there was no YouTube and there was, you know, there was limited books and stuff. So you learn from other musicians. That's how you learnt. And um, apparently he learnt from the keyboardists of Coliseum 2 or Coliseum, the original band, I don't know. And and that's how, if you look at all his work pre then and, and after, there's kind of a, a real change in his playing style. And you can really see that, especially with the songs like, you know, he started playing these songs, you know, like a... So, you know, you've got all, you've got all, all of that sort of modal stuff that he was doing and, and, and playing, you know, all the, the chord scale in the key of C, for example, that Parisian walkways had, you know, we were talking about this earlier, still got the blues and, and Parisian walkways, they kind of, they're kind of a, a, a jazz sequence, a well-known jazz sequence used in lots of well, Also, things. also, so two things here. First of all, uh, also the melodic minor. Yes. Right. Yeah. Which he only ever used as a color. Mm -hmm. He never used it as a kind of feature, but he always used to slip a couple of melodic minor yes. feels in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The other thing is going back to that video we did recently where we featured some deep purple work. Yeah. And I think that there, there's a parallel here when when Richie Blackmore, who was mm -hmm. basically a beaten blues blues player. Yeah. Um, yeah. Met up with John Lord, who was a classically Lord, trained yeah. guy. Exactly. In come the interesting modes and scales. So, yeah. Very similar story. Yeah, yeah, so this is what happens when a guitar, a blues guitar player, hooks up yeah. with a keyboardist that's actually learned the traditional Fantastic. way. Real alchemy. And, yeah, and 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 you can really yeah. hear sort of pre Coliseum to post, and that really informed Gary Moore's playing so much. So, yeah. that, you know, you've got the blues, a raw blues energy. Because let's face it, who was you know Gary Moore and Roy Gallagher was the blues guy, wasn't he? From from that's right, from and he was also very high energy. Yeah, from Cork. Very high energy. Um, Rory yeah. from Cork, and you know, so he. Gary Moore obviously was very aware of him and you know there's that sort of Irish high energy thing like you're saying element yeah. mixed with this the, the you know so you know that classic there's, there's, there's a word that comes to mind here mm -hmm. right the word I think you're looking for is rowdy rowdy yeah right that in the early days of Gary Moore and also you know when I used to go and see Taste with Rory Gallagher god he was yeah. sublime he was fantastic but he was rowdy. 
it was it was like you know it was like a bar that's about to kick off that was the atmosphere yeah, really so, good so when people go oh you know um i'll i'll, I'll tell you this anecdote I, I went once i went with my then time girlfriend who um didn't like guitar music at all um and uh, there was a gig at the bush hall and uh, and uh my friend not a friend actually an acquaintance was playing first he's not a friend at all i've only talked to him four times he was playing first but i know, I know him and uh and it was a typical blues band you know bluesy guitarist great guitar player i won't say who and my girlfriend was absolutely bored out of her skull and then the the main band otis taylor came on and otis taylor's you know quite the gentleman amazing performer i know him personally and then he said i've got a special guest coming and this is in bush hall in london small hall yeah, and, brilliant and gary brilliant moore band. comes gary moore comes on and it's like holy you know this is gary I mean, we're in a small little place and gary moore's turned up and my girlfriend said, "Who's that?" I just said, "You're about to see one of the greatest guitar players ever play guitar now." And she and she was, no, no, you, yeah, no, but get this. absolutely thrilled. But the, but the early the, the the original band, who I'm not going to say who it was, quite a well-known guitar player, pretty big name, everyone like, rates him. He was kind of sneering and going, "That's not blues," and he's kind of camp was saying, "Ooh, it's, Gary Moore's not blues." It's, you know, and even a, 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 a mover and a shaker in the blues world was saying, he's all right, but he's not blues. So everyone was saying he's not blues, you know. And <laughs> But who cares, man? This guy played his ass off. And my girlfriend was literally standing on her chair. She was literally in tears. Oh, good. So um, talk, talking of small kids. Who cares if it's blues or not? It's entertaining, did, man. Did you ever go to Charlotte Street Blues? No, but I think, did he do his last concert there? So Charlotte Street Blues was probably the best blues club in London and also was like a proper nice bar as well. It wasn't scuzzy and filthy. It was really, the whole experience was high quality. And I used to go along to quite a lot of the open nights there and all the rest of it when they were run by the great Sam Hare. And one night a mate of mine uh, phoned me up and said, you fancy a you know, drink tonight? I said, yeah, always. He said, uh, I think there's a good gig going on Charlotte Street Blues. And we walked in, we didn't buy tickets. We walked in, got ourselves a few bourbons went to the front of the balcony, looking down onto the stage. Thank you very much, Gary Moore. Right, in a club that held, oh, 200 people and it was half full, it was perfect. Yeah, that's on YouTube. That's on YouTube, Bob. It was perfect. It's, it's, and and I, that I night, we, we, we were above him, we could actually, we, we, could, we could see, we could actually see him using his pedals because we were above him. So we were was looking down on him. Firebird, did he have a firebird then? No. I don't think so. I think one of these? he might have even been playing a Les Paul studio. Okay, okay. So maybe that's not, the concert on, that's not the one that's on YouTube then. The, the, fire, the Firebird um, outings were, were, of Gary Moore's were pretty rare. He only used it right. as a flavour. He, so, he didn't use it as a main squeeze much. That, that red one he had, didn't he? And he had a 64 yeah. as well. So, so, yeah. so let's, get, let's get back on track. So then he's, he's done the Coliseum too. He's, he's learned his modes. The, the keyboard is kind of like taught him his modes, and then he then he's got into this whole this whole metal thing, and then he's done a, a really good song about actually about the troubles in Ireland with Phil Linnett. They did this kind of song. It got on, got a really cool video of him wearing a little military you know Hendrix type jacket, and then and then he kind of like he's doing the whole metal thing, and people love him. He, he's even playing a PRS. Uh, I won't hold that against him. God bless, uh, God rest his soul. Um, and you know, and then and then he comes back, and then he well, he sort of disappears. I, I remember my mum. You know, when I, I I started playing guitar at seventeen, my mum was a real hippie rocker, uh, and uh, he came out with those two albums. You know, those two incredible albums. Uh, Still got the blues, and after hours. You know, after hours. Yeah. You know, so uh, and you know he um, he uh, you know what I mean. He's you know those two albums really did. It didn't matter if you liked him or not. You know, my, even my brother was a jazz snob. He was really getting into jazz. So if it wasn't Miles Davis and it, and it wasn't Grant Green, it was like, huh, you like Gary Moore. That really sucks. Right. And I was just like, no, man. You know, if you play guitar, because my brother's a bass player, but I was like, if you, it doesn't matter if you're into John Coltrane. If you play guitar, you know, Gary Moore is one of the greats. It doesn't matter what style of music you like. Gary Moore can play it. And he plays the shit out of the guitar. <laughs> You're, you're talking about an important period, though, in his life, because a, a very good guitar player friend of mine years ago, he said something around the time those albums emerged. He said, Gary Moore's got it right, because first of all, he's playing what he wants to play for the first time in his life. But second, secondly, he's also now playing the notes that everybody wants to hear. Before, he'd been playing what most of us guitarists do. We play all the bloody notes we can stuff in. I certainly do, right? 
he was playing all the notes that people wanted to hear. So you listen to the solos on those two albums and they're all immaculate, they're beautiful. But the most satisfying thing is as he builds the solo and you go, I really hope he goes up to, yeah, yeah, oh, he got that yeah. note. Yeah. And then he, he goes he up was to the a, next one. He was amazing at hitting the note on the dime. Beautiful builder, but, but yeah. he was, he, the thing about those solos, why they're so satisfying is because yeah. he kind of plays what you're wi willing him to play. As yeah, opposed so, to a shredder who's like, blah, 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 blah. it's like, yeah. oh, shut so, up. So, so this was in 90, 1990, 1992. Let me put that into perspective. You know, you had yeah. Nirvana just coming out and Guns N' Roses and Metallica. Yeah. You had those yeah. bands coming in. You know, Dire Straits made their last ever album around that time, 92 or something yeah. like that, I can't, on every street. I know. You, you, yeah. you like your Dire Straits. I have to, I have to say, yeah. I, lo I lost interest and patience with that stuff really quite early. I know well, it sold billions, but... I know, but I just like, you know, what I like about Dire Straits was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love that. You know, just... Yeah, yeah. But I know what you mean. It, it got a little bit corporate. But, you know, Gary Moore, so he came out and you've got to remember 1990 was a weird time because you still had, you still had this kind of big production, you know, you had like Tina Turner... You had, you know, yeah. in these very produced albums, Phil Collins and Eric Clapton, these mega beautiful produced albums. Sting, yeah. lots of Sting. keyboard players as producers. Yeah, and Sting was making these yeah. incredible soundscapey albums, and, yeah. and and then you had Nirvana, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then Def Leppard are like, oh sh oh shit, we're gonna have to rethink our game here. <laughs> you know, well, the band that record recorded every guitar yeah. part string by string. Yeah, but to to Def Leppard's credit, they did. They came out with um. They came out with a new sound. He was wearing, you know, every you know, yeah, and, and and then um, Axl Rose was wearing a plaid sort of a lumberjack shirt like Nirvana. It, it you yeah. know, it changed music needed Nirvana. They 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 needed that shake up the Seattle sound. Almost it, you're, what you're talking about is a replay of what happened in the seventies, right? You had the pomp of prog, which just got completely bloody silly with all the silver cloaks and rubbish, and then you got the 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 shock correction of punk, and what you had with the arrival of grunge was a it wasn't nearly as sharp a shock but it was the same thing it was a correction and in fact it, the, the police were always we're going off in the tangent but the police were hilarious because the police were really <laughs> they were imposters because they weren't really punks but they used the punk scene yes to get you know well they were new wave you know but you know they, they but then, like, but then, then it came know. then it reversed on them because at the end <laughs> of their career they'd become mega fucking huge and corporate yeah right yeah. Yeah. and they didn't want to be although they liked the money but they didn't really oh, yeah. want to be corporate either. So they yeah. weren't punk to start with. They weren't corporate to end with. They got stuck in the middle. Yeah. Still, but, you know, brilliant. but it gave them the, the, the money to do what they wanted after that. So. Yeah. And the rest. But, so we, 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 and, we're gonna... and enough to enough to lose nine million pounds with an accountant without even <laughs> knowing it, knowing it. Oh, my God. So let's get yeah, back to Sting's, let's... Sting's accountant, Nick, nine million quid off it. I, I remember that on the news. Yeah. So let's get back to Gary Moore here, because um, we, 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 we want to find hit, you know, legend or fallen hero. Well, let, let's find out the first reason he we're going to because there shouldn't be any negativity around him. But there, there was a slight incident because um, on the uh, the album where he played this progression, if I can play it now for you guys, which goes something like this. Let's, uh, let's get my. Um... <laughs> And so that 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 um you know there's, I've actually done a whole video on this, and apparently he was in a he was heard it on the radio or he was in a in a rehearsal room and they were a, a German band who had re originally written this song were rehearsing, and and then he got sued for plagiarism, you know. Oh, did he? I yes. didn't know that. He got sued for plagiarism, and that was one of the reasons they said he sold the Les the famous Greeny Les Paul. We haven't actually talked about that, but along the way, Gary Moore of course sold his SG. That he had in Skid Row, and um, and Peter Green um, gave him the famous Greeny Les Paul, which is now with um, Kirk. Is it Kirk Hammett of Metallica? Kirk Hammett. And yeah. um, there's a whole there's a whole who, history who, and story. And everybody is saying he didn't pay two million dollars for it. No. Okay. I, Sorry, well, mate. I'm not not buying it. I reckon he did. Well, no. Actually, with with um, that that's a whole there's a whole another subject there. But but the whole the whole point is is that here's Gary Moore. He's written this inc incredible song. It's a great song. Still got the blues. It's a brilliant song, right, Bob? Yeah, it's a wonderful song. 
It's a, it's a but if it's somebody else's called somebody else's called sequence. But tell me, have you got your dates right here? Because still got the blues. You're back in the nineties. Okay, if they sued for plagiarism. Okay, if they sued for plagiarism, even yeah. allowing for the incredible drag of the court system, that plagiarism yeah. case would have would have come around in the nineties. Right? Uh, it didn't sell that. It didn't sell that guitar until decades later. Um. Yeah. Yeah. But this is this is what happened. He sold. And, and he sold. As I understand, he sold that guitar to fund the separation of a third. I think it was his third disastrous marriage separation. Well, okay. So in, in, he actually let, let me just let me put this into perspective. So th this is from the internet. Berlin Routers, who are a um, news <laughs> consortium from Germany. Um, oh no, it's got the. Oh, I can't read it because it's been blocked. That's fantastic. But this this looks like it's December 2008 this came out. A German court oh, has okay. ordered has ordered yeah, former yeah. Thin Lizzy guitarist Gary Moore to pay damages after ruling the guitar solo in. So it was a melody. It wasn't the chords because you can't... Oh, right. It's a melody. It's, it's, ah. It's a melody, yes. Yeah, a melody. Interesting. Identity. That does, melody. to be fair, that does make it, that makes it a more obvious copyright claim. But nevertheless, isn't yeah. it interesting that it took 18 years... To prosecute. Yeah, and the original band had written it in 1974. Okay. Okay. So, so anyway, let, 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 so but that that happened later in the career. So w w we're discussing this where he was really the the, the legend. These um, incredible two albums, and then so that 90, 90, 92, uh, he he did After Hours with the incredible song Separate Ways, brilliant song, and then he did BBM in ninety four. So he, there you've got three albums, and then he did Blues for Greeny. So there you've got these incredible albums. Yeah. Which are, you can't deny though, and it, and he was. I remember just walking out of Liverpool Street Station, seeing Blues for Greeny in a huge poster. Yeah, and he he was it around in the, the the early to mid nineties. Gary Moore was a known person. Yeah, he was mainstream. Okay. Yeah, he was mainstream. And after that, this is where we're talking. Things kind of took a dive, a little bit, and maybe he lost inspiration. Uh, maybe he was just. You know, I think there's two there's two sides here. I think you can either say he found his niche and he was just going to continue there, or else he tried various things like scars. He actually played um, explorers. He bought three Gibson explorers and 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 you know, scars is quite interesting. He, he was using like drum beats, you know, drum loops, and then playing sort of Peter Green style guitar over drum loops, but essentially. Right. But there's some okay. quite nice stuff, and, and I think it, what was nice about him, he was always reinventing himself. You know, and, and and he kind of always wanted to go back to the heavy rock thing, you know. So because he had so many, he had the Thin Lizzy thing, he had the the heavy rock thing, and he had the blues thing, and he he'd always be, you know, going back, maybe doing an album, and maybe that was his fault. Is that if he'd just stayed, like you know, the Joe Bonamassa's just do one thing, one thing only, was because Gary Moore was such a versatile guitar player. He 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 was known for doing different things, you know. Whereas Joe Bonamassa, not he. Joe Bonamassa never came from a famous band, you know. He was he, Joe Bonamassa was just you know on the blue scene in Europe, copied Gary Moore <laughs> essentially, <laughs> and made some money out of it and success. Whereas Gary Moore, you know, he had the Skid Row thing. He had you know he met Peter Green whilst in Skid Row, and you know. Uh, uh, you know, he did the prog rock thing and then he did the blues rock thing. And, you know, he had so many different facets. And he was, let's face it, he was George Harrison's favourite guitar player. So imagine having the Beatles as your number one fan. <laughs> and they used to live they used to live near each other too, didn't they? He lived yeah. down in Henley. Yeah, he yeah. played on the Travelling Travelling World Prices album with uh, Bob Dylan and uh, Roy Orbison and all that. There's a, That's pretty good company. That's pretty near royalty, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I, I just think, you know, Gary Moore was, he had the potential, but because I think after those four great albums, he kind of, he kind of lost his way a little bit in terms of, he, I mean, he didn't lose his way because he knew what he was doing, but I think, you know, commercially, I think it wasn't as successful because he, he did confuse his audience. Maybe, I don't know what you think about that. No, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think he, whether or not he, I don't think he anticipated the success of Still Got the Blues and After Hours. Uh, and I think he then suddenly became a bit stuck with it. And as you say, he sort of rathed around with it. He did those two tribute albums because BBM and Blues for Greeny and they're very different ways of those tribute albums. Um, yeah. They're yeah. bloody good, but they're tribute albums. And then he went off and went, so many guitar players go off into the kind of the beats and the loops 
and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, he was guilty you know? of that and, a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and a few people have kind of pulled it off, but generally speaking, you're kind of mixing fish and fowl a bit already. Um, and, yeah. and, and, it, it, and, and so what happened was that he had to kind of retreat into what people knew him for and loved him mm -hmm. best for, and he still had a really good living off it, but it wasn't quite the same high level of stardom. No, it, it wasn't, because I mean, he, he was carrying around with him a really big band. You remember in those early 90s? He had, yeah. you know, full full the and then he was hiring in BB King and Albert King, yeah. and you know th there was a lot of times where there's a f hilarious thing where where um, um, BB King he's he's they're playing that song you know um, you know thread is gone and and uh, you know um, uh, BB King's playing a lick. And then Gary Moore copies it, you know. And every every lick that BB King plays, Gary Moore copies, but he doesn't stop. And and you can see BB King is is going, man, you know, hey, let up a little bit. And Gary Moore doesn't. And because Gary Moore is so well, excitable, he's so excited. He's like a little puppy. There's another you know? example of that. If you go on to, um, I think it's After Hours, isn't it? Since I Met You, Baby. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great beginning. Yeah, you know, one, two, three, four, dang, did a letter straight yeah. in, and he trades solos with BB. Yeah. Right? Now, if you're going to trade solos with BB King, I mean, even the greatest players, yeah, when they're in the room with BB King, they show some respect, they show some deference, and this was yeah. the not so great side of Gary. This was the street fighter coming out of Belfast, right. probably a tough yeah. upbringing. Yeah. You know, you hit them first in on the nose before they whack you, right? Yeah, yeah. And he yeah. took no bloody prisoners, and he plays. He doesn't quite play over BB, yeah. but he gives him no quarter at all. And you've got this incendiary, intense guitar. And actually, yeah. that bit is yeah. brilliant guitar from both of them. But Gary, mate, you overcooked it. You've got to have, you know, when you're working with these BB King, you've got to have respect because they were the guys that invented it. And oh, and, and that, that made me I uncomfortable. It was live at the Marquee yeah. and, and, and Gary Moore's copying every lick and it made me uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah. stop it. You just yeah. stop it. Don't do that. Not with BB King. Yeah. You know, and he and he got to a point where it's like, uh, you know, and it's a real shame. Well, look, look, but, you know. Ramon, Ramon, I mean, you know, again, this is apocryphal, you know, and it's yeah. it's 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 you know, it's unkind to speak ill of the dead, but no, he, no, no. he, he wasn't known for being he wasn't known for being the most um, sensitive uh, and conducive fellow. He was a, he was a bit of a bull in a china shop, but a hell but, of a skilled bull. But let me just say this. The actual, if, we, if we're gonna, if we're, if we're gonna say that, I want to add though that I, because I saw him with Otis Taylor. Now Otis Taylor is an amazing singer from, I think he's from uh, Louisiana or Alabama or somewhere. Uh, excuse my terrible <laughs> geography, American geography sense. But um, anyway, I think he's from Louisiana, and he's actually a cycle. He he he, he runs a cycle team out there or whatever. Um, but this guy is a very very huge guy, um, lovely guy, gentleman, and but he's not he's not well known and there was no money for that tour and gary moore just came as a fan liked him and said look i'm going to come and play and tour with you just for no money right. i'm just right. gonna you can have me and have my yeah. name and i'm going to help you because i like what you're doing so i think gary moore he, he was a really generous and nice guy i mean i you know that's that's the kind of vibe that i got personally and i actually met him at that concert and he was a really friendly lovely guy so um you know i can only speak good of him you know from from the uh, experiences I've had, you know, personally. So I, um, I, 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 I would say I would say having having watched him play many times, and watch it, I would say you know fantastic talent. You know, God, if, I, yeah. if one of my fingers could do, you know, that would be amazing. But um, it, he had a tendency to overplaying and heavy handedness too often. And that well, why I think those like, blues, that, he, he played those two blues fingers, albums are so good is they yeah. were him as his most restrained. And yes, yeah. At his yeah, most yeah. restrained, he was yeah. exceptional. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my, it was interesting because his technique, he, he, he would be very much <laughs> that kind of thing, and he's playing with two fingers almost. Yes. You know, and then he go brrr, uh, uh, blistering. <laughs> You know, it was all this kind of intense, but you know, maybe maybe there's a place for that, and maybe there's enough room for one person to to play like that. And the the, the thing with the, the difference between me, um, Gary Moore, and Joe Bonamassa for me is Gary Moore meant every note. 
he put passion you know there was a lot of in all those pubs in because he had obviously had cuts on his face right so he must have been in a fight in in a pub a rough pub in london or in in Ireland, probably in london because you know back in the day you know there was a a bit of racism against irish people in london right and probably you know if you went into a london pub in the 70s and you were irish someone didn't take a liking to you there's going to be a fight if you, went, you know? if you if you went into a pub on the kilburn high road in the 70s and you were english you'd have a bigger problem so anyway the point <laughs> is the point is is that he's come like you said from a rough place in belfast or whatever where you have yeah. to play you have to play there's no well throw the first punch get your first punch in mate yeah. that's it in a world like that, you get the first punch in. You, if, if they're going to give you trouble, you knock them out before they've got a chance to give you trouble. That's how it works. Yeah, and so yeah. that was his attitude yeah. when he played guitar. It was intense and it yeah. was... And whether you... You know, some people really wound them up and they didn't like it. But I personally, I loved it. I, I loved that intensity. Um, and maybe that's my... A little bit of criticism against Joe Baldamassa is that it is a little bit... It's formulaic. It's clever, but it's formulaic. It's, it's, there's no passion there for me. It's, it's executed immaculately. But it doesn't have that abandonment, sheer, yeah. you know, passion that Irish, you know, that Irish blood, you know, you know, like Roy Gallagher. Roy Gallagher was the same, even maybe even more so. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, what is it like yeah. watching Roy Gallagher? Because I never saw him. So I saw him when he was pretty young, uh, and he was he was very rough and ready. You know, always a check shirt, jeans. Uh, you know, that beat up Stratocaster through an AC30, alternating with a blonde Telecaster he played slide on. Um, you know, and always pretty, pretty high octane stuff. Quite shouty, you know, but it was good. But then you see, I, I, I like that era because the song's in taste. You know, he was, he was also wrestling with trying to stretch out the blues idiom. Their second album on the boards, he played saxophone, he played keyboards, he played all kinds of stuff as well as guitar. And it wasn't world class, but it was really good effort. But the songs there were really pushing beyond the blues, you know. Whereas when they play live, it tended to be more bluesy and more shouty. And then, and then, you know, gradually you realise that's what the audience wanted. And so by the time you got yeah. live taste and onwards, it became it became much bluesier. Let, 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 let's just finish off with Gary Moore. Thank you for that, um, Bob. But let's just finish off here with Gary Moore, and then we can discuss a, a little bit of his gear at the end. Um, so, you know, I, th I think around the 2000s, you know, the court case 2008, he actually damaged his hand in a garden accident and had to cancel a tour as well and then had Ooh. to pay a lot of money um, to, for the insurance or the insurance didn't cover it, so he had to pay a lot of money. And, okay, and, so you've got some bad news, bad news here. You've got somebody suing him for the melody. You've got a, a yeah. serious accident causing a cancellation of the tour. You've got wifey number, whatever, you know, yeah, cutting and running. Right. He, he did have quite expensive taste in the ladies as well. So... You know, probably highly mortgaged as well. So he, he probably had a few financial worries. Yeah. So, so there you go. And and, and he's, you know, he's, um, and, and we say this in the best possible taste. God rest his soul. He's, he's an amazing guy. Um, you know, he, he maybe his his artistic direction suffered as a result, and he kind of he was just like, okay, well, I'm going to rest on my laurels here. You know, I've got a good little insurance package. I can always go and do yeah. big gigs out in Europe. He never really yeah. conquered America, so he wasn't interested in going and touring in America at all because it yeah. would cost him more yeah. money. Um, yeah, it would have cost him more money, yeah. yeah. And he would earn. So he, he was just kind of... And then, and then you've got Joe Bonamassa turns up. Your friend. <laughs> and Gary Moore's like, oh dear. <laughs> oh my, who's this young punk? What's going on here? Who's this young punk? Suddenly turned up and stolen my, all my gigs and all my licks, and he's made quite a success of it. You know, well, he's basically he's mixed it. Gary. He's mixed Gary Moore and Eric Jones. Yeah, he has. But but you know, he he actually took Gary Moore's model of how you can make it in Europe. You know, how yes. you can do those big festivals and the big yeah. concerts and make a living. Yeah, make a very good living yeah. in Europe. Yeah, work Maybe, hard. You know, yeah, play those. Work yeah. hard, play that, and play the, play this blues rock style that everyone wants to Got hear. It. Yeah, make write the ballads. You know what was Gary Moore famous for? Was those blues rock ballads? Yeah. And so, what did Bono Massa do? He wrote a couple of ballads. You know, I don't know. I don't yeah. know his music very well, but I, I know he wrote one called Slow Gin, which was you know a, a ballad, a typical yeah. kind of Gary Moore ballad. So you know, 
But I, I don't, I don't want to knock go, um, <laughs> Joe Bonamassa at all, you know. <laughs> at all, he's a fine fella. He's quite a gentleman. But um, and he's a great, great red hot, red hot guitar picker. But um, we're talking about Gary Moore here. So I think that was really the downfall, if there was a downfall. But you know, th- towards the end, towards the end, those last concerts that Gary Moore did, he was playing a custom shop Les Paul through a reissue Marshall, very limited pedals. I think you must have seen this rig. And and he was kind of coming back. It was almost like it was just a, like an fu attitude. I'm just yeah. going to play my guitar how I want to play it, to the right. edge of you know explosion. And <laughs> and that's me. This is me. And he was doing small gigs like the Charlotte. And I, yeah. I really felt that he was on the verge of of. It was like yes, you've got something here, Gary. You're coming back with something. I don't know if you felt that. Well, and then he died. Yes. Yeah. Yes and no, but I mean, the trouble is the gigs he was playing, there wasn't really a living in those gigs. No. So, you know, I mean, they, they were wonderful gigs, you know, I mean, I, but I've always loved seeing great artists in very rarefied small audience spaces, you but know, they, like, like back, back to Bloody Body Master again, you know, when he played the Borderline, right? right. Two, uh, two Marshall Stacks, I played four, the four by 12s. <laughs> in, I played the Borderline, right? But it's a great I gig. tell you what, I mean, we both played the borderline. I think we could readily agree you don't need two two Marshall no. hundred watt heads and no, four no. over to four by twelve cabinets. It's a it's a small it's a small venue, it's a small venue right? It's but, you know, off you go. But, but you know that that was very much a showcase. That was all sold out to people in the know months before. No no public tickets. Blah blah blah. All the rest of it. Different 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 reasonable. And also it was videoed for the movie he's just released. But the problem is that Gary Moore was almost regressing towards the end of his career because he was going towards the smaller gigs, which people like me love, but there wasn't a living in. But 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 maybe this is what I I always thought was kind of wanting him to be like, okay, I'm going to take us back to the small gigs. I'm going to play more simple rig, and then I'm going to retool yeah. and come back again with a new album. I always yeah. thought that that was what he was he was his probably plan was I probably. I I certainly hope so. Yeah, yeah. But I, I did yeah. see a renaissance in his pe- playing towards the end. Uh, I mean, he didn't, he, you know, he, he, he looked a little bit heavy, uh, physically he looked a bit heavy, but yeah. I, I felt that he was coming back with with some really inspiring, and, and what he was famous for, you know, that that really intense and, and playing. Yeah. I really, yeah, yeah, and I like yeah. the fact that he was just, he banned, he was just like, give me a custom shop, Les Paul, I don't need a, uh, I don't need Stripe or the old one, uh, and I'd give me an old, a new Marshall, reissue Marshall, that's fine, I don't care what it is, and, and he just played, and I think there's one concert of his, a bigger concert where he's he's got this, reissue Marshall sort of the JTM 45 thing or whatever maybe it was even a 100 watt one um, and uh, and he was just playing th- amazing tone no reverb just dry as a bone just you know yeah. really cool so what do we say we, we say he is a legend and sh- th- th- let's conclude this Bob oh uh, clearly a legend clearly clearly I mean like all the great musicians probably a little bit troubled Checkered career, few zigs, few zags, but bloody legend, total legend. Total and, a fe- and a fellow burst owner, as a fellow burst and a owner. burst owner, yeah. You know, had, it was I was kind of it wrong, but I've got the finger right there. You go, fellow burst owner, yeah. And 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 you know, think about that. He, you know, when he came with those early, those two albums, still got the blues and after hours. It was he actually bought Stripe to do that. You know, he actually went out and bought. Um, you know, because I think the Peter Green one was either valuable or it was stiff to play. Um, and he just went. He had three. He had he had two bursts and he and had a gold 57 gold top yep. with black parts. Yeah. Which, when I was looking for this, uh, somebody uh, tried to sell me. Oh, wow. Uh, because he was actually selling it. So his tech turned up with this guitar. Now, that's back. Now I play, I almost play 11s on this guitar. So I'm almost up there. But at the time, I was probably using nines. And this right. guitar had 11s on it. And frankly, I could have played a tree easier. It so, was such yeah. a man's guitar to play. Well, geez. I mean, I mean, um, this, this is, um, this Explorer is, is based on a 58 and it's um, got 11s on it. But what's nice, I think, with all the Gary Moore guitars is he, he preferred, I mean, he could play a Strat really well. People forget that he was a great Strat player. You yes. Know? Um, there's a good uh, concert, you know, I think it's a Fender anniversary concert where he plays Red House or something. And he does a great version of that. But um, yeah. You yeah, know, he he was really known for coming back with a Les Paul, you know, um, you know, slash at yeah. the same time with, 
yeah. Guns and Roses, and 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 Gary Moore sort of really brought the the Les Paul back. I bought, I probably bought um my Les Paul because of Peter Green, um, but he brought the Les Paul back. He he really you know made it yeah popular. I think he helped it yeah you know? um, yeah. So um yeah that's, that's and don't forget by the way just finishing off on gear yeah don't forget of course he was one of the players one of the many big players who went through a long Soldano period. And indeed, when he was doing those bigger gigs, oh, he was very famous for having, yeah. he had a he had a 50 watt Soldano with him on stage and he had a hundred watt in a special enclosure off stage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That's because right. And that was the thing that was doing the roaring front of house tone, but the thing was so uncontrollably loud, it had to be put in a sealed box mm -hmm. and mic'd off. So that's how he was getting that big, big tone back in the you know the bigger gig days yeah and let's talk about soldana because who was playing soldana at that time it was mark knopfler yeah in the clapton. 90s doing that last tour in yeah. 92 93 eric yeah. clapton and yeah. gary moore and you know those three yeah. they were the three big guns of you know the british kind of guitarists in the early 90s at that time and well, those were... amps now sell for big money really well i say big money but i mean yeah. as you know amps compared to guitars are cheap yeah yeah with the with the exceptions of dumbles and train wrecks you know, you're hard pushed to find an amp that's more than about five thousand quid. And, and I've easy heard... to find a guitar. Christ, vintage three three O's are more than five thousand quid now. So amps are cheap, right? But those sold down. If it, you know, really good amps like you know, your and my overdrive special amps are not doing fantastic numbers no. in this market. No. Really, you know, um, those old sold down. They're changing hands for four and a half, five thousand. That's quite good money for an amp. It is, and and it's funny because apparently Mark Knopfler went deaf. Um... We lost a lot of hearing, <laughs> and also <laughs> Gary Moore lost hearing as well. So I don't yeah. know. Eric Clapton probably lost his hearing way back. <laughs> it was Massively crazy. loud, yeah, yeah. But they're they're very yeah. extraordinarily loud guitar amps, yeah. And I think yeah. that's why he probably stopped using them in the end, is because they were just so loud. And uh, but th well, that one, was... one thing all the way through his tone, though, the one thing he always played through four by twelves, and right, so you always got that wonderful kind of thump and thud that you get off a four by twelve with a closed back. Yeah. And you can hear that even on some of his gentle stuff, you get the feeling of it. But when he lets loose, whether it's yeah. the Marshall or the Soldano, you've got that four by 12 good dump. Yeah. It's a wonderful tone. Um, and and what's, what was so great about his, his playing was like he, he, he would do slow sort of. And he was very, you know, so precise with the phrasing. You know, and 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 with there's a kind of a I can't remember the song, but it's on one of those albums where he did all the loops, and and just beautiful phrasing, you know, with the blues rock kind of Peter Green phrasing, you know, always with that distortion, but just like you know, just so precise, and everything he played was precise. It was perfect, and you know that's why I kind of prefer Roy Gallagher. In some ways, was his abandonment of precision and just going for the heart and soul yeah i mean and and you know as you know i i tend to like tidy guitars players more that's why eventually you know i didn't yeah. really stick with rory gallagher as a as a, as a hero because he, he just got messier and messier and messier whereas gary moore was yeah. tidy uncontrolled but tidy but yeah. bonamassa as you say he's dressed for dinner yeah but bonamassa is is pr primed 24 but eric, eric johnson eric johnson you listen to his playing it's immaculate yeah. Yeah, you know? it's um, and Best I think, dinner. and that 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 if I could make a, a comparison between us British guys and Americans, is that um, Americans always seem to be more schooled than us and, and more technical, uh -huh. whereas the yeah. British, like if you if you look at a bass player like Mark King, yeah, okay, Mark King, the bass yeah. player from Level Forty Two, very famous for that, you know, the slap bass and. You know, Mark King is is the best slap bass player I think in the world. You know, but he had this kind of technique which was incredible. You know, but somebody like Stanley Clark was much more sophisticated and uh, had a grasp on jazz harmony like you couldn't yeah. imagine. Whereas Mark King didn't. Mark King could just do the technique and write brilliant songs. And well, Mark King never. Song. Put, so, for example, did did Mark King ever play a double bass? No. Well, Stanley Stanley uh, Jordan. Yeah. Is, is that Stanley, Stanley Clark. Clark. Sorry. Yeah. Stanley Clark. Right. Half his gigs were double bass. Yeah, that's right. You see, yeah. Tony Levin. Right. Yeah. He's playing that uh, stand-up stick. stick. Yeah. Or he's playing fretless, or yeah. he's playing fretted. You know. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's it, they're coming from a different place. They're coming you're from right. a different. We, you, but you're you, right, though. Yeah. You're, you're right about this business of being schooled. You're right. 
I think I think you know British we have more heart we have a kind of a heart gritty heart and soul and I'm not saying the Americans don't but I'm just saying the Americans tend to be more schooled than us as musicians they kind of know yeah. what they're doing more whereas we're yeah. more chance yeah, British do. we're more chances <laughs> we just get in there and do you know what I mean <laughs> that'll I'll do say, certainly works for me just say never say no just say yes if anyone yeah. if anybody can you do that yes and then worry about yes. it later. that's that's the yeah. British Whereas the Americans yeah. are probably like, uh, no, I need to go to Berkeley, uh, Berkeley first, study for absolutely. Years. Come out, can yeah. you do it? Yeah, I can now. Yeah, absolutely. But talking of which, should we wrap this up? Let's wrap this up. This has been amazing, um, an amazing Bob and Ramon show. Everybody, you've got to come to the new channel. You've got to subscribe to this little link we're leaving right down here in the description. The Bob and Ramon show. We've done this for you guys. It's all about you. It's not about us. We're making sacrifices for you. Well. You say that. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're doing this for you guys. Please subscribe because, you know, we, we want to take you to this new channel, which is called Bob and Ramon Channel, and it's just going to be Bob and me talking a load of rubbish about guitars. Yeah, it's a unique, you, our unique uh, style of bollocks. Wonderful. Yes. Actually, today, though, we've been very, um, we've been very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Unfocused. <laughs> random. Chaotic. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we're, we're just getting back into this because we've had a bit of a layoff, Bob and I. We're, we're just getting back. We're just getting the partnership well, back together. Hang on, I've, I've got the excuse. Having had, having had the jab today, of course, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm 90% bonkers for the evening, so, you know. That's your excuse. <laughs> there you go. All okay, right. then. So until, until next time. Until next time. Take care, guys. All the best. Goodbye. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.